This is MindShift. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Hilary Webb. Thank you. It is a tremendous honor to be here. As I said to some of the people who were here last night, I think the wonderful thing about this conference is there's such a wonderful opportunity for cross-breeding between different subject matters. And as Rudy was talking about his subject matter, I found myself going, well, that's kind of like this, and then this kind of like that. So, you know, as observers, you maybe can uh, you know, connect the dots yourself a little bit. So, um, I'm here to try and explore the uh, enigma of human consciousness in about 45 minutes, so I'm gonna jump right into it. <laughs> Okay, uh, So the way I'm going to structure this is start off with a little bit about me. And the reason I'm going to start off with a little bit about me and I, how I define consciousness is because what I've noticed is we don't often define our terms when we're talking about consciousness. And whether we are speakers or whether we're talking to each other, Consciousness is such a huge term. How do we, how do we know what we're talking about? I, you know, I remember in grad school having a conversation over wine with one of my colleagues and talking about, I don't know, some subject about consciousness. There was a lot of hand-waving and there was a lot of refilling of the wine glasses and there were a lot of throwing out words like epistemology and, you know, this and that disagreement until about maybe 45 min in, minutes into it when one of us said to the other, how are you defining consciousness? And we each gave our definitions and the other one said, oh, okay, yeah. I can see how you, yeah, I can see how you come to that conclusion. So really what I wanted to do is start off with uh, kind of orienting us in terms of who I am, how I approach consciousness, my particular jumping off place. And uh, from there, looking a little bit at uh, the two main branches of studying human consciousness, the qualitative and the quantitative approaches. Uh, from there, going into uh, Karl Popper's metaphors, of uh, clock systems and cloud systems. And then because my focus is qualitative research, I'm going to be focusing primarily on what it is about qualitative approaches that can help us to come to get some idea about the nature, function, and potential of human consciousness. And then we'll do a little wrap up. Okay, a little bit about me. So, if there is a, an initiating event for my interest in the study of consciousness, it's probably, well, probably many things. I grew up in Salem, Massachusetts, so I was exposed to this kind of thing much of my life. Um, but the anecdote that I'll tell is I was about this age and went over to a friend's birthday party, slumber party. So you can imagine this bunch of six, seven-year-olds running around. We ate our cake, drank our soda, played games, and we crashed. So somehow I was put sleeping in a sleeping bag on the floor in between two twin beds. Fell asleep, middle of the night, woke up, startled awake. Oh my God, somebody's going to throw up on me. <laughs> so I kind of went in my logical mind and said, all right, it's probably not the hostess. She's Probably gonna, you know, she's probably not. She's not gonna have a nervous or stomach or anything, so it'll probably be her. So I scooted, you know, a little bit closer to her bed, went back to sleep. Some amount of time later, I woke up, hostess turned over and threw up on me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of those inciting incidents for me of, you know, how did I get that information? Why did I get more information? <laughs> And what is the potential of human consciousness? What can we do with consciousness? Uh, and from my experiences, um, personally, professionally, I think human consciousness is actually quite remarkable. So yeah, so uh, started off with a real interest in beyond ordinary knowing or non-ordinary knowing. And uh, this was a great passion of mine for most of my childhood, and uh, it was cut short by a certain incident, which I'll get back to, hopefully, if I remember later at the end of the talk. And, uh, but I stopped completely sort of looking into this realm when I was, you know, about 12 or 13. But then again, when I was uh, in my mid-20s, I got introduced to shamanism. And for me, this was a real eureka moment for um, 
you know, shaman, the shamanic techniques really are for me a, uh, you know, a bunch of practices that really give you a set of tools and techniques for going into altered states, for finding the ability to acquire non-ordinary knowledge, which was a very exciting thing indeed. And so after a couple books and a lot of experiences working in the shamanic realm, I decided I wanted to go back to uh, school and get a little bit of academic grounding in all this. So I did my master's at Goddard College in consciousness studies with a focus in the reconciliation of opposites and looking at different spiritual and philosophical traditions that see the opposites as being complementary rather than in an antagonistic war, as is often the case in our culture. Uh, my PhD was in psychology from Saybrook University, and there again I went to Peru, spent a lot of time there looking at the Peruvian concept of yanantin, or complementary opposites, as being their philosophical jumping off place. Again, quite a contrast to the antagonistic model that is pervasive in the West. Um, after that, yep. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, as Michael mentioned, I'm managing editor of Anthropology and Consciousness Journal. I was a research director at the Monroe Institute. So anyway, the point of all this is to say, you know, one of my primary interests is looking at how the opposites can come together, how we can find ways of using the strengths of both pairs in order to come to a greater whole. Um, and as I said, qualitative approaches to the study of consciousness is my place where I jump off from. So. All right, so my approach to defining consciousness <laughs> You know, as I said, we don't often define our terms. You know, as a speaker, I suppose if I define my terms and you have a completely different view, I've lost you already. So I'm going to tell you how I approach consciousness. And, you know, I don't believe it's the answer to what is consciousness, but it's how I approach it. So um, my definition is... Uh, alignment with Aldous Huxley. I don't know if any of you have read The Doors of Perception. It's a wonderful book about Aldous Huxley's experiences um, using mescaline back in, I don't know, I think it might have been the 30s or the 40s. And I really uh, appreciate the way he sums up his experience and how it informed his relationship to consciousness. I'll read out loud. Each person is, at each moment, capable of remembering all that has ever happened to him and of perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. The function of the brain and the nervous system is to protect us from being overwhelmed by funneling the information through the reducing valve. What comes out at the other end is a measly trickle, leading us to believe that reduced awareness is the only awareness. However, Through these permanent or temporary bypasses, for example, spontaneous altered states, intentional spiritual ex exercises, hypnosis, drugs, there flows something more than and above all something different from the carefully selected utilitarian material which our narrowed individual minds regard as complete or at least sufficient picture of reality. Okay, so keeping in mind that... The definition that I use for my work goes like this. Consciousness is the means by which the total sum of experience, information, knowledge, and understanding becomes available to us, both through states of ordinary, such as daily, ego-bound, linear, causal, etc., awareness, and non-ordinary, non-local, non-linear, transpersonal, etc., awareness, and... As human beings, we are in every moment experiencing and being transformed by the world through ordinary and non-ordinary means, whether we are aware of it or not. But ask me again tomorrow, I might tell you something totally different. <laughs> so, a couple things to notice about my particular approach. Um, I'm not really all that interested in what consciousness is, ultimately. Um, I'm very interested in how we experience it. I'm interested in how those experiences transform us. I'm interested in how other cultures, uh, both within our own culture, a lot cross-culturally, experience consciousness and what we might learn about consciousness as a result of looking at these various perspectives. And uh, a term that I'm going to use possibly frequently, it's uh, experiences of consciousness. And what I mean by this is 
really it can be a variety of things. You know, we think of altered state experiences as being dramatic ways of experiencing consciousness and experiencing this non-ordinary and ordinary consciousness. But in our daily life, we really have all kinds of experiences of consciousness, from revelations with a big R to revelations with a little R. You have uh, an argument with your spouse, let's say, and suddenly you step outside your position and listen, and suddenly you get what your spouse is saying. And that's a revelation with, well, it could feel like a revelation with a big R, but those daily re revelations are experiences of consciousness. So when I say experiences of consciousness, it's really a very wide range. So now I want to talk about the two branches of studying human consciousness. And from these two branches come many other branches, but I'm going to stick with the two since we've got a limited time. So uh, the quantitative is more or less the domain of experiment, the experimental sciences, neuroscience, behavioral <laughs> psychology, etc. A question that a quantitative researcher might ask is, for example, what neurological shifts occur in the brains of individuals during rave trance dances? So, you know, it's, um, you know, I'll get to it a little more in the next slide, but it's a lot of uh, big picture. What, uh, what are big groups of people reporting or um, what are they showing on our instruments? So the qualitative researcher, which usually encompasses the humanistic sciences, anthropology, transpersonal and humanistic psychology, might ask that a similar question, but say, what is the psycho-spiritual experience of individuals during rave trance dances? And again, we've got some of the attributes of the quantitative versus the qualitative. So we've got, you can see the, the quantitative, we're looking at qualities, we're looking at measurements, numbers, statistics, a lot of data, a lot of, um, looking at not so much human experience, but the you know, statistical analysis of human experience. Uh, whereas qualitative, you're looking at the qualities of a person's experience. So you might do an interview with a research participant and look at what they say and look at how the words inform their experience or how they are describing an experience. What words do they use to describe these experiences of consciousness? And, what might this tell us about consciousness in general? And uh, in the quantitative field, you know, there's a real desire for a strict objectivity to keep research her and research e very separate, so that your own, as the researcher, your own perspectives, biases don't muddy up the, the data that you're gathering. Um, in qualitative, on the other hand, there's, uh, you know. As an anthropologist, part of my work turned out to be building relationships with, um, with my research participants and participant observation and getting involved with them. And along those lines, quantitative, you know, in order to create the strict objectivity, you want to kind of go in with a really premeditated design so that you're following very strict steps to keep that objectivity as opposed to the qualitative, where you can be pretty free-flowing and, and the design will emerge. Um, in my work, in the book that's coming out, I went down to Peru to look at this concept of yanantine, or complementary opposites, and I was planning on doing a very traditional ethnographic study, and um, just, you know, got there, sat down with my, my primary research participant, pulled out my notebook, said, okay, describe Yanantine. Tell me what Yanantine is. <laughs> and he looked at me and he kind of, you know, politely rolled his eyes and he said, all right, well, you know, I can, I can define Yanantine if you want, but can I suggest that you download it from the Cosmos instead? <laughs> so that's a longer story, but the point being, what came from that is because of my interactions with my research participants, I was sort of, you know, forced very nicely so to uh, change my research plan so that my relationship with the material became much more personal. Yeah, so having left 
very qualitative humanistic schools and background and all the experiences that I've had, it was discouraging to walk out into the professional world and discover this war of the world views that's going on between the qualitative and the quantitative sciences. And attending uh, conferences and, and very heavily dominated with the quantitative. And, and don't get me wrong, quantitative is absolutely necessary and I am fascinated and excited by what is being discovered through these means. But very surprised to find out that the qualitative approaches are dismissed, disparaged, discounted. So what do we want to know about consciousness, all of us, whether we are quantitative researchers or qualitative? You know, probably many other things, but for example, we want to know about its nature, we want to know about its function, and we want to know about its potential. And um, I'll get into that a little more in a bit. So as I'm trying to sort of piece together these days, um, the future of this field in my mind and, and where I want to go with it, You know, I ask myself, are there ways of bringing the two fields together? Are there ways of validating both sides with each other in order to come to a greater understanding of who we are as people, as human consciousness? So one of the uh, metaphors I love to use when I'm thinking about this is the scientific philosopher called Karl Popper divided the world into two kinds of systems, clock systems, and cloud systems. So as he described it, clock systems are orderly, they're predictable, they're reducible, and they're mechanistic. So, you know, clock systems are great. They help us, you know, figure out, okay, I've got 45 minutes, and i got to make sure I get a certain amount of information done in a certain amount of time, and I want to make sure that everybody gets the lunch okay, and so on and so forth. So these are good systems to you know, keep in mind. Cloud systems are unpredictable, open to interpretation, relational, and naturalistic. And um, so just imagine that you are laying in a field with a friend, looking up at the clouds, and one of you says, oh, I think that cloud looks like a horse, and the other one says, oh, I think it looks like my third grade math teacher, and let me tell you about what she was like. So who's right and who's wrong? You know, it's neither. It's, it's interpretation based on memories, based on thoughts, based on emotions. So think about your daily life. You're sleeping. Say it's uh, 5.59 in the morning and you're sleeping and you're in the middle of this great dream. Clock system or cloud system? Maybe, maybe cloud system? That's what I say. Six o'clock, the alarm goes off. Clock system or cloud system? Clock system. Next 45 minutes, you kind of, no, actually, I should say, uh, you know, you wake up a little bit, you think, okay, how much time have I got? Have I got enough time? Or, yeah, okay, I'm going to hit the snooze. <laughs> so you go back to sleep and you have one of those great sort of hypnopompic dreams where it's really vivid. And, and then the alarm goes off again, so you're back in the clock system. And you get up and you make the coffee and you keep looking at the clock to make sure that you're okay, still good, okay, gonna wash my teeth, all right, still good, still good, okay, I'll take care of you in your car. Driving, driving, driven this, you know, half hour drive for the last 10 years. So you're driving, you don't know how you got there, you get there, but you've thought about all the things you want to do with your day and everything you did yesterday and uh, thought about the dream that you had. So we are engaging in clock and cloud systems back and forth, off and on. So the question is, consciousness a clock system or a cloud system? <laughs> I say both. Uh, and maybe something like a spiral. Rudy. <laughs> Down in Peru, uh, I just, I just love their worldview, so I, I bring it up a lot. But they engage with time and space and consciousness as both cloud and clock. They consider it a spiral. And as a spiral, it's sort of both linear and cyclical. 
and they find themselves able to and willing to engage with time, space, consciousness in both ways very easily and move back and forth. So. so here we have the question, in what ways can qualitative modes of inquiry help us investigate human consciousness, in particular its nature, its function, and its potential? Because, as I said, what do we want to know? We want to know nature, what it is. What is it? We want to know its function. What does it do? What does it do for us? Why do we have consciousness? Why are, is, why are our consciousnesses the way that they are? Why do we have memories? Why do we have thoughts that we have? Why do we have the subjective experiences in the way that we do? And its potential. Not only what, what does it do, but what does it super do? Remote viewing, things like um, psychic experiences, things that go beyond what we are very comfortable with in a daily, ordinary course of events. What else is possible? So I'm going to go back to the question that was uh, used as an example earlier to show how research is being used to um, look at consciousness in a qualitative sense, and in particular those, uh, those three questions about the nature, function, and potential. So what is the psycho-spiritual experience of individuals engaged in rave dancing? So it's nature. When we look at consciousness, how does it reveal itself? And what I'll say, you know, qualitative is not all that interested, typically, in what consciousness is. I think the quantitative methodologies are much more interested in, you know, finding that reductionistic, you know, what, what can we reduce it to, which is fine. It's very interesting. Um, but really, for, as a qualitative researcher, I'm personally interested in the experience of it. So I'm going to read from an article that recently came out in the Anthropology of Consciousness describing what has been discovered about the nature of consciousness or you know, illuminated through the uh, participants of a rave dance party. And the participants say, a vibe is established when a critical mass is reached, when there are enough people feeling and giving up positive energy to create a collective feeling. The egocentric self is replaced by an experiential model wherein the I is superseded by we, and thinking is second to feeling. It is a somatic experience that silences the inner language so prevalent in our waking consciousness, allowing the dancer to live quite literally in the moment. This unifying energy binds participants in a collective experience. So, what do we see here? The collective feeling, the critical mass, so the nature of consciousness and being in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. This is a, a fairly typical thing that people describe cross-culturally. And it's one of the things that indigenous cultures will use ritual and these altered state experiences through dancing, through ethnic, um, psychedelic drugs, through a variety of means in order to create a kind of communitas within the community. So here we have you know, evidence in, uh, in our own culture of ways in which this kind of mm, nature of consciousness as a unifying, you know, boundary dissolving possibilities of altered states of consciousness is being expressed. So now sticking with the same question, looking at function. So how do these experiences of consciousness experience within the ray of trances help the individual survive and thrive in the world. So again, being described by the participants and by the, the researcher. For many participants, their experiences within electronic music dance culture have radically altered their notions of self and personhood, permanently changing not only perceptions of the world, but also how people choose to interact with it. This feeling carries back to the everyday world in which participants have reported a more concrete engagement in life. So, 
what we can see from this is, you know, uh, these experiences of consciousness help people to have a sort of a communal experience. It helps them transform their world, transform themselves. And it's interesting to see the ways in which these um, experiences of consciousness that we have translates to our daily life or not, and the ways in which we can translate them. Uh, you may be familiar with the story of the four rabbis. So you had four rabbis who went up into, got transported up into heaven, met God, came back. You know, they had this outstanding, ecstatic experience, and they came back to their daily lives. And one rabbi went crazy. One rabbi began to sort of uh, lecture about it, pontificate, and talk about it, and he kept it very much at an intellectual level. Another rabbi became a cynic, and he decided, you know, that didn't really happen, and I don't believe that it did, so I won't even think about it. And then the fourth rabbi um, didn't know what to make of the experience, but he wrote songs about it, and he wrote poems of love to his mother and his children. So I'm always very interested, how do these experiences that we have function in our own lives and mm, create a greater sense of peace and love. And I can say that the experiences that I've had have certainly changed my life and, and made me you know, feel more comfortable in the world. So the potential. What are human, human beings capable of? So Rudy talked a little bit about some of these interesting things like remote viewing and psychic phenomenon and so on and so forth. You know, we don't typically follow those altered states in this culture often. Um, we don't often follow to what is the potential for, for example, healing. Other cultures do, and I'll read another. So from another article from the Anthropology of Consciousness. How does what goes on inside the mind-brain of the shaman during trance bring about changes in the patient's mind and body? So, here we have a culture that not only uses these states of consciousness in order to explore its nature and function, but continues that on to greater healing and, and beyond ordinary knowing. So, to read this. Through the trance dance, the shaman enters into an altered state of consciousness to harness the, pow harness the power of the numinous beings for the task at hand. During the trance, arrays of different types of supernatural beings manifest themselves in the room. The shaman embodies and controls these numinous entities, shaking and trembling violently as he does so. The visibly sleep-deprived patient in a transitional state between sleep and wakefulness begins to experience the full force of the shaman's power. The shaman demonstrates the awesome supernatural powers he has harnessed by inserting his hands into a cauldron of boiling water and shows everyone that he is unscathed. So through the qualitative process, we can get testimonials of what people have experienced and get ideas about where we can take the, the enigma of human consciousness and how to explore it and ways in which it can be explored. And, and uh, for me, that is an exciting process. Um, clock or cloud? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, apparently I have enough traditional research in me that I think I left out an important aspect of my presentation on the slides, at least. And what that is... Um, you know, really looking at the practical value. Um, I think traditional research looks at the data, and, and you know, data is, is it, and data is where it's at, and, you know, the knowledge. Not so much, where do we take this afterwards? How, how can we practically use experiences of consciousness in a way that makes us better human beings to each other, to ourselves? <laughs> and... I had mentioned earlier when I was talking about my, my childhood, and the reason that I stopped very suddenly when I was a kid, stopped sort of investigating psychic phenomenon, looking at, you know, perception and these interesting things about human consciousness, I suddenly thought, what if I go crazy? What if I think the wrong thought, and I lose my mind, and then I'm just gone? 
And I don't think I'm alone in this culture in terms of the fear of the mind that we often have, that many people have. I'm sure a lot of people in this room do not, because I think any of us who are here are probably interested in exploring consciousness. But uh, in the 1980s, the linguists uh, Lakoff, Lakoff and Johnson wrote a book called Metaphors We Live By. Very good book, very interesting. It looks at how the metaphors in the English language not only create but reflect our relationship to the world. And for me, one of the most interesting and meaningful metaphors was the metaphor of the mind is a brittle object. So they give examples of how this is considered to be so. So you have a sentence like, his ego is very fragile. Her mind shattered. The experience ripped him apart. So what do we, what do we take from that? You know, whether whether we believed it before we heard that or not, somehow we get into our minds that the mind is a fragile thing that needs to be tightly held and controlled and looked after and so on and so forth. So I told you the story about going to Peru and saying, you know, opening up my notebook and being very left-brained about it, and I'm going to write down that definition, and I'm going to make my research professors very proud of me, and so on. And having my, my shaman friends say, you know, you've got to download it from the cosmos. I'm going, what does that mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what he said was, you need to download it through the cosmos, through going into ceremony with San Pedro, which is a mescaline-based cactus. And, you know, I figured by that time, okay, I've done shamanic journeying, I've experienced with this, that, and I, you know, I'm, why am I afraid? But I was. Um, what would I find out about my own mind? What would I learn? What if I didn't learn anything? Maybe that's the worst part. What if, what if this, is, this experience was possible, but not something that I could have? Um, so after a lot of mental wrangling and processing and working with them, I just I did decide to go into ceremony, and the stories are in the book that's coming out. And it was a, it was it was outstanding, and and so one of my soapbox -ish, box issues is how do we become less scared of our psyche? Because I think only in becoming less scared of the contents of our own minds and the contents of our consciousness, will we be able to really go deeply into the nature and the function and the potentials of human consciousness? So, you know, it's sad to me that in this culture we don't have many outlets for that. Places like the Monroe Institute you know, offer a wonderful opportunity to have a safe place to go dive into experiences like this. And there are other places as well, I'm sure, that you could all share. Um, yeah, so that is, that is to me, uh, one of my great sadnesses for the culture that we live in is our, our fear of the mind and that it gets uh, legalized and illegalized and experience, as Rudy said, you know, when you make something off limits and experience off limits, it's no longer, you know, it's no longer real in some sense. It doesn't exist. It's no longer on the table for model building. And as far as I'm concerned, we need all the tools we can for model building, both the qualitative and the quantitative. So, so I'm going to leave you with a few meta questions because honestly, I have no answers. And really, the point of my talk, I want to, I want to generate a discussion going about how to make all this happen. So, what do I want to ask you? Uh, why do we always put more faith, more faith in machines than our own experience? <laughs> you know, working at the Monroe Institute, uh, we at times would put people, you know, as they were going and having their um, journeying experiences, apologies to anybody who doesn't know what the Monroe Institute is, but we study consciousness and um, by sound technology. And so anyway, I had, had somebody hooked up to the galvanic skin response, and you know, we're watching on the computer as little beeps and things are going up and down and showing us you know, how nervous he is, if he's relaxed, and so on and so forth. And the guy's laying there, and um, 
We say, so how are you feeling? Are you, are you getting relaxed? He goes, I don't know. Does the machine say I'm relaxed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did we get there? So, again, so walk it through. Let's, let's start to trust our experience because it is highly meaningful. Let's find ways of, you know, partnering experience with the rigor of science that is also so necessary when, when needed. So another meta question, how do we bring these two ways of knowing together? You know, I'm, I'm really interested in reconciling the opposites. You know, that's a lot of what my work has been. And uh, I don't have an answer for that. And I would love to hear and work with any of you that are interested in working towards that goal of reconciling the opposites. And I'm sure it can't happen all at once, obviously, maybe not even on a big scale. But, you know, as I said, conferences like this, to me, are the future. They are where people from very different backgrounds, very different interests, come together in a really sweet space where we can start to talk about these issues and in, a, in a way that's respectful and open. So, yeah, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Carl Jung, which I hope to inspire you in, towards this kind of thought. Uh, so Carl Jung wrote, The opposites ought, in their harmonious alteration, to give life a rhythm, but it seems to require a higher degree of art to achieve such a rhythm. I'm going to read that again. The opposites ought in their harmonious alteration to give life a rhythm, but it seems to require a high degree of art to achieve such a rhythm. Mm. A high degree of art. I really like that. Mm. So I'll leave you this question. So what form of high art can we create together to bring together the qualitative, the quantitative, different ways of knowing in order to expand our knowledge tenfold? Please let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. That was really wonderful.